You need to mute. Got it. Maybe it's being live streamed. Do you have any idea how many people watched it on, on, well, you can see it. Hey, am I in, I can, you can hear me now? Hello. Hi, we're just waiting one sec. Jake, are we ready to go? I just need one moment to get up. Fantastic. All right, it's great to see everyone for our second in a three part series with Mike Hollander, who unfortunately, as um, he can address if he wants, has more time on his hands than he expected um, with. Uh, what is going on with Israel and COVID. Um, but we are blessed to have him. Um, I, I emailed him enthusiastically after his last session with us. He's one of the best guides I've ever heard speak. There's a, a line from the play, A Walk in the Woods that says, history is geography over time. And um, Mike just embodied that in all um, that he shared. And I'm so excited to have him with us for a second. And then a third week, next week, this week we're going to Poland as we look with Mike, who's an Israeli tour guide at our Jewish journeys and other places as well. So Mike, I'm gonna hand things over to you. Welcome. We hope you are busy once again soon with more than just virtual things. But God willing, wait, when you quoted Rabbi Walk in the Woods, is that by Bill Bryson? The play, A Walk in the Woods? Yeah. I'll look I mean, it up. He wrote, he I'll wrote look the, it up. I think he wrote the book, very funny yeah, travel. A Walk in the Woods, History and Geography Over Time. That's all right, well, quotes. thank you all. History is, say it again, history is? Geography over time. I think I heard it when I saw the plane. I just wrote it down. It was I saw it before there were iPhones. Cool. So hold it. What's going on? You don't think you want the this? Sorry, that is my family. And anyway, that's your beautiful family. That's nice. They're that, gorgeous. That was my family. That's my. There we uh, go. That's me. Where are they again? I guess you. Yeah, I'll show you guys. <laughs> they are beautiful. Family. What am I doing? Anyway. They are there somewhere, yeah. um, our growing family. So we are going this week to Poland. Last week, we talked about this notion of a tikva, the hope, this kind of part of a Jewish DNA, I think, that has helped us get through very, very challenging and difficult times, including the time that we find ourselves in, in today. But this week, we're going to a place, I'd say in the past 20 years, I've been to Europe maybe 50 times, at least half of them to Poland. My first trip to Poland actually was in the 1990s. The March of the Living. I was a educator with teenagers from Montreal, Canada, and uh, I didn't really want to go to Poland. But a friend of me, a friend of mine, had suggested that I do go to Poland. My four grandparents all come from Eastern Europe. They all came to Canada, and the after First World Wars, from Poland, Russia, Lithuania, and the Ukraine. And my two grandmothers, I never had the good fortune of meeting my grandfathers. Both from one from Ukraine and one from. Uh, one from Ukraine and one from Poland, said, never, there's no point in going to Poland. They all hated us. Everyone there was suckled on their weaned on the anti-Semitic blood, with the milk of anti-Semitism. And I was a bit reluctant to go, but I went the first time. I went the next year as well. And then I said, I've done my part. I've been there. I've said Kaddish for lost relatives in, in Auschwitz. And it took me a, another probably five or six years to go back again. And when I did, I began to look at it from a very different perspective. And I think in the 25 years since I've been going to Europe, I look at things very differently than I did when I first went um, in the mid 1990s. I start with this image. I don't know how many of you have been to Poland, but Poland is a uh, Warsaw, I should say, in Poland, the capital in Poland is a city that's going through a tremendous amount of change. When I first went in the 90s, it was just a few years after Glasnost and the fall of the Iron Curtain. Today, it's a country that, similar to Ukraine, borders, well, parts of it, well, a little bit further, but is very close to the Soviet Union, is very much in the shadow, sorry, of Russia, no longer the Soviet Union, and is very anxious about that, wants to be part of the European Union. It is, wants to be much more integrated with the West. 
And I think the story of the Jewish aspect of Polish history is very, very important as well. But I begin with a, a prism through which I want this week in Poland and next week in Russia to us to kind of look and, and in a sense change our lenses through which we see reality. Because the next hour is going to be this three-sided prism. One will focus on about a thousand years of Jewish life in Poland, a very short period, and that's a millennia. That's a long time. I mean, the American Jewish history is not even 400 years old. The Shoah, a very short period in Poland, 1939, September 1st to be precise, until May of 1945. And finally, the more complicated side of this prism, 1945 to the present. Um, and you'll need to take off your glasses and put on a new set of lenses in order to understand what I'm going to be talking about uh, this afternoon. So this three-sided prism will focus, as I say, on the good times as well as the bad times, the times where we invited in, but later on expelled, times of anti-Semitism, pogroms, times of creativity and insularity, times of conversation with the larger society around us. That is an important part of a visit to Poland. And I think for most people that I have the opportunity to meet and guide around Poland, for them, this isn't really part of what they're coming for. Largely, it's the second aspect, the Shoah. Poland was the epicenter of the mass murder. Three million of the six million Jews murdered in the Shoah were Jews in Poland. The major Nazi killing centers were all established in Poland. But it's only six years' time. As horrible as that event was, if all we do was to look at Poland through the prism of the Shoah, we'd be doing an injustice to my family and probably many of your family's millennia story and experience in that part of the world. But it's the third part, which is, I think, the most complicated and challenging. And that is, can there be any Jewish life in Poland? A country that used to be 10% Jewish. Imagine 33 million American Jews, not 6 million, but 33 million. Phenomenal. A country that was 10% Jewish, three and a quarter million Jews at the end of the war, there are 10% left. And within about 20 years, there's only about 100,000 Jews left. Can you actually have in a few handful of thousands of Jews today, a Jewish community? It's a big question. What is the nature of the relationship between the state of Israel and the state of Poland today? Very, very big and deep questions. And I'm, these are all teasers because in an hour, I'm not going to be able to answer all of them. If in 50 three minutes from now, I leave you with more questions than answers, then I will have done my job. I'm going to begin, though, with the story. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Given by Shai Agnon, the only Israeli to win a Nobel Prize for Literature, a little over 100 years ago, describing how we came to Pauline. Let me put my uh, laser pointer on here so you can see it. When Israel saw how its sufferings were constantly renewed, oppression increased. I'm reading on the right-hand side. That's me over here dancing around. Persecutions multiplied and how the evil authorities piled decree upon decree. He's speaking of Germany, largely, and France, where Jews were expelled end of the 11th, 12th, 13th century. Followed expulsion with expulsion. There was no way to escape the enemies of Israel. They went out on the road and sought an answer on the paths of the wide world. Which is the correct road to traverse and find rest for the soul? Then a piece of paper fell from heaven and on it the words, go to Polania go to Poland. And thus the story begins. We came to the land of Pauline. We gave a mountain of gold to the king. He received us. And this is the story through much of Jewish life in a millennia in Christian Europe. We were invited in. We served the interests of the monarchs. We were protected by the monarchs. We paid tax to the monarch until the monarch would be more religious or, the or ideological rather than pragmatic and would fall under a greater influence of the church and would expel us again we lived in tranquility for a long time. We developed trade and handicrafts. God was a blessing to us, etc., etc. When they came from the land of the Franks, from Germany, they found wood in the land. That's us. On every tree, one tractate of the Talmud was in size. This is the forest near Lublin. And those who seek for names say, this is why it is called Pauline in Hebrew or in Yiddish. For they spoke Israel, for thus spoke Israel when they came to the land, here rest for the night. Paul, here, lean, lalun is to rest or to sleep. And this means that we shall rest here until we are gathered into the land of Israel. Now, if all you knew about Poland was what happened between 1939 to 1945, this would be a foreign language to you. The idea that we were invited into Poland, the currency was printed, was, 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 was pressed with Hebrew writing on it, that we were protected by the king, that we were very creative and we had amazing Talmudic academies there. That's all glossed over when we only look at Poland through the prism of the Holocaust. And that's why I put this up here at the beginning. And much of what I'll be talking about is Jewish life in Poland before the Shoah. Where did we come from? Again, there's Poland on the right-hand side. Look at all the dates. Don't read all the details, all the, the, the names and all the years, 
But notice the movement. The area I'm working actually now for another synagogue in a presentation on this area called Shum, Speyer, Worms, and Mainz. This was the area, Worms was where Rashi was for a short time, a thousand years ago. This is the area of the actual Ashkenaz. This is what it's geographically called along the Rhine. But we were kicked out in all these years, and where do we go further east? Why? Because the monarchs in the east wanted us to settle there. Some even came from Por Portugal and uh, and uh, Spain in the end of the 15th, beginning of the 16th century. My wife is convinced that her family is Sephardic. They left Spain, Iberian Peninsula. They settled in Poland. They were there for hundreds of years until they came to America. That's why we have rice and bamba and hummus on Pesach, because we firmly know that we are definitively Sephardi. And there's a good chance that a large number of Ashkenazim, hundreds of years before, were Sephardim. The area we'll talk about next week, Russia, is right kind of this area in between, the area of Russia, Poland, Lithuania, Galicia, um, uh, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, a little bit further up above, Ukraine down over here. And again, we are in the wider context of the Ashkenazi world. Jews were further east of what we call Poland today. Vilnius, for example, is in Lithuania. Bialystok, for example, is in Poland. Lviv today over here in Galicia is in Ukraine. So the borders change a lot over time. But again, Casimir in the 14th century, very, very supportive, very welcoming to the Jews. In fact, King Casimir himself supposedly had a girlfriend slash wife slash lover named Esther a beautiful Jewish woman named Esther. Does that remind us of another story that we read every single year at Purim time? Things were good for a long time, but then things went bad. And that's very important for us to recall. So when you go to Poland physically, and you will enter into this decade old museum, not even a decade old, I should say behind me. And then you'll also notice that there's this wall in front of us. It's the backside of a memorial that I'll look at a little bit more in depth in a few minutes time called the last March put up in 1948, commemorating the destruction of Polish Jewry. This has been here since 1948, this black part. And 15 years ago, they started the building, this new museum, which tells a thousand years of Jewish life in Poline, subsidized, paid for by the city of Warsaw, by the Polish government, by the Jewish government, as well as by private philanthropy. It's a story that tells a thousand years of Jewish life. And there are some of my colleagues who don't even want to go in there. From Israel. They say, why do we want to tell the story of Jewish life? We know what the moral of the story is. The moral of the story is quite simple. Things were good, things were bad, but ultimately the bad overcame the good, and this is what happened, and we were all kicked out and we were all murdered. There's no point in having any Jewish life there today, and there's no point in really celebrating the thousand years of Jewish life that was there. I fundamentally, educationally, philosophically disagree with that, um, because we wouldn't have been there for a thousand years if things were only bad, right? Things are bad, and you leave, and you get kicked out, and you go somewhere else. Um, and that's why I say, is it good or is it bad? If Europe was the center of Jewish life up until 39 and Poland was its center, then there's no question that Warsaw was the center of the center. Jewish population of a third of the city was the second largest community in the world after New York City at the time. Keep in mind, I know Miami probably is a larger Jewish community, but in Israel today, only Tel Aviv and Jerusalem have a population as large as Warsaw was in 1939. It was an incredible center of diversity in so many fields, in literature, in science, in the arts, various Zionist movements, which became the political parties in Israel. Almost every political party in Israel today has its antecedent in Poland up until the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, and I have here, if I can figure it out, there were rich Jews and, and poor, secular, ultra-Orthodox, everything in between. So when we say Polish Jewry or Warsawian Jewry, we're talking about just like a city of, I don't know, how many in Florida, 300,000, half a million, whatever, a very, 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 very diverse community. And I want to share for you this short little video, uh, Rachel Auerbach, a member of a group called the Oneg Shabbat, which was a group you'll meet in a few minutes time, which chronicled the events of life under Nazi occupation in Warsaw and across Poland. It's a short two minute movie, about two and a half minute movie, amazing video footage of the diversity of Jewish life before the Shoah began. When I came to Warsaw for the first time in the early 1930s, 
I was astonished at the intensity of Jewish life. Such a multitude of Jews I had never seen. Pious Jews in black gabardines, looking like priests in their medieval garb. Jews who were rabbis, teachers who wanted to transform our earthly life into a long study of Torah and prayer to God. And still other Jews, broad-shouldered, deep-voiced, Jews who, with a blow of their fists, could floor any hooligan who dared enter into their neighborhoods. Rachel Arbach belongs to the first generation of Polish Jews who got a higher education. She became a journalist and a leading member of the Yiddish-Polish intelligentsia. She was a literary, art, and film critic. She wrote about women's literature, but also about position of women in contemporary society. She emphasized the double exclusion Jewish women were experiencing as women and as Jews. In Warsaw, there were six Yiddish daily papers and two dailies in the Polish language. There were two steady Yiddish theaters and many traveling troops. The Yiddish Literary and Journalist Union had 400 members. This Jewry had about 100 modern Jewish schools in Warsaw alone. A state within a state, the Polish anti-Semites screamed. And there was slight truth in that, especially culturally. So I love this video because it gives you, first of all, life before death, number one. Why is it not going further? And second of all, it gives you a bit of color. I take sense visually some of that diversity that I was talking about, about Jewish life in Warsaw, because most of the images we have of Jewish life are those that are given to us by the Nazis, the perpetrators, the Nazis and their accomplices. If you look at any museum, I haven't been to the Miami Holocaust Memorial, but in New York and in Washington, and, and obviously Yad Vashem, many of the images are images preserved by the perpetrator rather than those of Jewish life beforehand. And I think one of the challenges, and I see this in Israel at Yad Vashem, the new Holocaust Museum, new, 2005, it's already been open 15, 16 years uh, this March, but it focuses on life before to understand who the victims were before they became victims. And I want to give you a bit of a sense of this rich community through a, a tale of, and I'm borrowing this title of some other British author, I think came up with it, a tale of two synagogues. One is the Tomaki Street, the great synagogue, which was a progressive liberal, not reform as we would know it today, not uh, your, your temple, which was totally destroyed. And the other, which survived the Nozick Synagogue in a city that had over 400 synagogues full on shuls and little communities, little uh, centers for praying called Shtibalach. The Great Synagogue, 1878, the biggest in the city, one of the biggest in the world, 3,000 people. Liberal, with, uh, with liberal in the sense that men and women were separate, but liberal in the sense that the sermon was given in either German, or in this case, it was given in, uh, in Polish, of course. It was right in the center of the city and its size and location gave a real sense of how comfortable the Jewish community of Warsaw felt. May of 1943, its destruction symbolized the end of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and really the death knell to Jewish life in Warsaw. Half a mile away is the Nozick Synagogue, still there. It was built late 19th century, much smaller, but it survived because it was used by storage by the Nazis, and it is still the center of the Jewish community today and is led by Rabbi Michael, American-born Rabbi, Rabbi Michael Shudrick. Here is, for example, the first of those two synagogues, the Tomaki Street Synagogue, you don't build a shul like this unless you're feeling quite comfortable. 1878, very similar in style to the uh, synagogue, if you've been maybe to the Doheny Synagogue, the Tobacco Street Synagogue, 1860 in, uh, in Budapest, the um, Plum Street Synagogue in Cincinnati, the Central Synagogue on the Upper East Side in Manhattan. A lot of synagogues built in this kind of Moorish architectural style massive structure. The Magen David on top over there, you can kind of see here, I will draw your attention while I'm circling around, one of the two menorot at the entrance, the other hidden by the tree of the synagogue. 
And to the left is this building called the Jewish Historical Institute, which survived the war, miraculously. That we'll come back to in a few minutes' time, but that is still there. The synagogue was destroyed. Here is the picture taken shortly after its destruction. All you can see is the leftover menorah in front of this amazing, beautiful and large and quite proud shul right in the center of town. Half a mile away, as I said, is the Nozick Synagogue. Oh, and what's there today? An office building. No connection whatsoever with the little sign. The Nozick Synagogue, redone, post glasnost of course, even under communism. You can see much smaller. I uh, you see the proportion. There's the bima down below. There's the Ezrat Nashim, the women's section up above. I've been in here many. You can see from down below. There's the, the bima. There's the women's section. There is a machitza separating between the women on that side and the men over here. Generally, it's a small community, but... When I come during Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Memorial Day in the spring, it's usually filled with lots of people who come at that time, of course. Where, therefore, do you really go to understand the rich fabric of, fabric of Jewish life that was before the war? No question the cemetery. Um, in fact, the name of cemetery in Hebrew is not just the, the simplistic word, which is uh, Beit Kfarot, the house or the place of tombs, but is oftentimes referred to as the Beit Chaim, or the Gan Chaim, the place or the garden of love, or the Beit Almin, the house of eternity. You can see these pictures taken from uh, outside the synagogue, outside of the synagogue, outside of the cemetery in Frankfurt, actually. We can see the renovation of the synagogue. It's not Warsaw, but I just put this up here because you can see Beit HaChaim, the house of life, because it's the cemetery where we go to to try to understand a little bit more about the life that was because most of the people in those cemeteries are people who were buried long before anybody had ever heard the word Holocaust or Shoah. But of course, in order to fully understand the cemetery, you already know me, some of you from last week, and I ended with a poem about hope from Yehuda Amichai, my favorite Israeli poet. But here in the last book, the same book that I quoted from last week, he has a poem that he writes, was published posthumously in English, open, closed open in the year 2000. Seeking roots in the Warsaw Cemetery, here it is the roots of the trees, of course, you'll see in a minute, that they are seeking. They burst from the ground, overturn gravestones, and clasp the broken fragments in search of names and dates, in search of what was and will never be again. The roots are seeking their trees that were burned to the ground. And you'll see exactly what Amichai is talking about. Here, what does he say? The roots are seeking. They burst from the ground and they overturn gravestones. And that they do. Bizarrely, Miraculously, many of the cemeteries were destroyed by the Germans. Many of the tombstones, the Matzevot, were used for, uh, you, you name it, and any other purpose. But much of the Warsaw Cemetery still stands here. You can see Evel M, the sorrow or the mourning, the loss of the mother, the matriarch. Beautiful funerary art, which give us a true sense of the diversity of Jewish life that was before all of the Shoah actually happened. There are about a quarter of a million people buried there today, including 100,000 people buried in two, and one outside, three altogether, mass graves used between 40 and 42. It's incredible, because those quarter of a million people were buried there in that short window from 1806 to 1939. And as I said, nobody, I say most people here, but nobody buried in that period had ever heard of the word Shoah because it hadn't happened before, it hadn't been invented. Famous Yiddish authors, many of us are familiar, Yud Lamed Peretz, uh, Ansky, Yaakov Dinazon. I grew up as a kid in Canada reading uh, Isaac Bashevis Singer. Um, he was from Warsaw, his brother was from Warsaw. And if we think again of the Jewish writing in America, like, you know, pre-Philip Roth, shall we say, or pre-Jonathan Safran Foer, these guys are heirs to the Singers and the Peretzes and all the other Jewish writers only in the modern era, almost all of whom are originating from what we, we would say is Poland today. You might not have heard of Ludwig Zamenhof, but a very important guy who is the inventor of a language called Esperanto. Born in Bialystok, late 19th century, he realized that one of the problems of, the, of, of hatred and xenophobia and racism as a minority in Bialystok, that was a 40% Jewish city, by the way, was that we couldn't communicate and we couldn't understand each other. If he thought we could speak this kind of utopian idea, a language that we could all share, maybe we could understand each other as we used to before the Tower of Babel. He was an ophthalmologist. You'll see his grave in just a minute. He's buried there. Mayor Balaban, director of the Jewish Historical Institute, one of the most important figures, leading, uh, a leading historian who ultimately, one of his students, 
creates a group called the Onik Shabbat, which we'll meet in just a few minutes' time, to chronicle Jewish life in the ghetto. Adim Chernyakov, the head of the Jewish government appointed by the Nazis, takes his life and is buried in the cemetery. Marak Edelman, one of the leaders, the second in command of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, after uh, Marek, after Mordecai and Levitch, he survives for 50 years after the war and w- lives in Poland as a prominent doctor and is buried there just less than a decade ago. Many prominent rabbis are buried there, etc., etc. Uh, and you can spend days, days still going to there. And interestingly or bizarrely or significantly or all of the above, it is still used by the small Jewish community that is in Warsaw today. Here's some pictures. That's me again. This is Zamenhof. You can see his grave over there, doctor, and it's written in the language of Esperanto, for those who, right, Crianso Esperanto, the creator, I guess, that must be um, Esperanto. And there you can see this this beautiful star kind of symbolizing international brotherhood and sisterhood, and it's always decorated. People are coming from all over the world because they see him as this person with this utopian idea of unifying rather than dividing humanity uh, about a hundred and a little less than 200 years ago. That's me in front of, again, the still standing tombstones inside the Okopova Warsaw Street Cemetery. Been there many times a year. And most of these pictures, by the way, are from my phone, crazily enough. Here you can see an amazing picture on the left of a hand putting coins in a tzedakah box. Some, someone who was obviously philanthropic. Here you can see broken candlesticks. It's a bit hard to see, but it says, Ponitman here lays Aisha Hatznuah, the modest woman. The matriarch dies, and the family puts up a matzeva. All these people who are buried there are people with people, tears in their eyes, coming to say Kaddish and coming to part for the last time from their friends and relatives, unlike all the other people buried in a mass grave and the six million who were murdered by the Nazis. Perhaps the most famous person commemorated but not buried there because he was murdered in Auschwitz was Janusz Korczak. There's a sculpture of him. His name wasn't born Janusz. Janusz is a Polish name. He was born Heinrich Goldschmidt. But to be more Polish, he Policized his name, like many of our parents or grandparents maybe anglicized their names. A prominent physician and educator. Um, his biography by Betty Jean Lifton is called The King of Children. Read it and you will see why. He really never had any of his own children, um, but he dedicated his life to children. He had a series of orphanages. He's what I oftentimes refer to on one leg as the Polish Dr. Seuss and Dr. Spock. Dr. Seuss, in that he wrote a book for parents, How to Raise Your Child. Dr. Spock, sorry, Dr. Spock. Dr. Seuss wrote books for children. And his children's books, like King Matt V, which I also recommend reading, is his worldview. Judge a child as a child, not as an adult. Every child has his or her own pace of development. Very prominent educator. If any of you studied education, you studied Piaget's theories of education, and you possibly studied Korczak. If you Google Janusz Korczak, I guarantee you his theories of education will come up there really, really high on your Google search list. He continued an orphanage with more kids under his care all the way until the summer of 43, when ultimately the Germans begin to take out all the living people in the ghetto and murder them in Treblinka. He went with his children, even though he had an opportunity to escape um, thanks to the Polish underground. Mike, and as I say, we go there wonky. not just... Mike, your sound, sound is a, a little... I think, are other people having trouble with the sound? or? Yeah, it's a little in and out. Maybe mute and unmute again. Um, Let me it's try just not... Right again. Hopefully okay, we'll, we'll let you know. That's Keep wonky. Um, and there's a memorial there. And again, it's not just about remembering the murder when one is in Poland, but it's really being blessed with understanding that rich legacy of Jewish life that was. Um, here is a picture that you might have seen of the two pieces of the sculpture in Yad Vashem. This is the backside, I showed you a few slides ago, of the sculpture that one sees as one kind of enters into the New Poland Museum. But this is the front side of it. This is called the Ghetto Fighters, and this is called the Last March. It's the same sculptor, the same piece, one on the backside. This is much more heroic, maybe. This is much more defeatist, whatever word you want to use. We could spend the rest of the hour just analyzing this. But I want to read the words of the Jewish sculptor, uh, Nathan Rappaport, who was a Russian, studied in France, went to Russia during the war, and ultimately came back in 1948 to create this memorial where the Warsaw Ghetto was. Notice the woman, the pregnant woman looking downward, the rabbi maybe looking up to heaven holding the Torah. But I want to briefly read the words of Nathan Rappaport, who made the sculpture. I conceived of Jewish martyrdom during the occupation. 
not as an isolated historical episode, but as a link in the chain of Jewish suffering, which stretches through the 2,000 years in the form of persecutions, oppressions, inquisitions, and pogroms. That is why, when forming the figures on the monument, he's talking about this part, I avoided the episodic, the fleeting, the transient, and tried to underline that which is universal, which is permanent, which is eternally Jewish. And what's amazing is that you look at these people, they are the same. These are relatives of these people. This was the minority response of those who physically fought in Warsaw, Bialystok, and other ghettos and, and, and camps. And this is the majority of Jews. But Rappaport puts the timelessness as this link in the chain of Jewish suffering, but makes one little distinction. Can you see the helmet of the Nazi soldier here in the bayonet? It's hard to make out. You can see another helmet back over here. You see over there, and another one over there. And it's hard to make out. But it's the author telling us this is a similar story that we've been through many, many, many times. Go back to memory that I talked about last week, and you'll understand what gave him the inspiration, I think, behind making this. This is what the Warsaw Ghetto looked like, by the way, after the destruction. Most of the Warsaw Ghetto, and then a year later, the rest of the non-Jewish site of Warsaw was destroyed. But thankfully, the students of Mayor Balaban, the director of the Jewish Historical Institute, who I mentioned before, who was buried in the cemetery, one of his students was a man named Emmanuel Ringelblum. There he is. And he, with a few others, initiated a group called the Oneg Shabbat, the Joy of Shabbat. And their idea was instead of singing and dancing and celebrating Shabbat, once the Nazis conquered Poland and set up a ghetto in 1940, they said, we're going to chronicle at risking their lives everything that's going on in whatever possible way that we can. Thankfully, UNESCO um, finally recognized just a couple years ago this collection of over 35,000 documents as a world heritage, as part of the World Heritage Register. And that's so important, not just for the Jews, not just for people in Warsaw, not just for Poles, but for all of humanity, collecting all of these documents in a very short period. Two of the arc parts of the archives were discovered in 46 and 50. And as I said, over 35,000 have been painstakingly preserved. And now I was there the last time in, I want to say 19, uh, 2019, maybe the summer of 2019. And they have on display one of the milk jugs in which they were discovered, as well as some of the documents. This is a picture of what was discovered. One of these boxes is in Yad Vashem, and one of these is on display at the Jewish Historical Institute. This is the original document. I just put it up there. It's very small. You can't really see it. There is another document written over there. Go online and you'll find them. I translated. I took a picture of the text on this one, part of the text on this one. It was written by Avram Levine after he had a conversation with a guy who was in a youth movement, Hashem Eretzeir, named David Novodorovsky, who had escaped, don't ask how, he escaped from Treblinka. In Treblinka, 870,000 Jews were killed in about 14 months. You can count on one hand, two hands, how many people managed to survive. Crazy, because everybody who got there was murdered. I quote, we had, and this is from this piece up here. And I will tell you, I've been to Poland dozens of times, but only once have I been to the Jewish Historical Institute since these are on display. And when I stood there reading them right next to, you know, standing right there, you can see it on your screen thousands of miles away, thankfully. But I got to tell you that I was listening to the people writing and having that conversation directly um, and ever grateful for the fact that these people risked their lives to tell us directly in first person what was going on in that dark period. We had a long conversation with David, who'd come back from Treblinka. His words confirm once again. Now, this is when August, sorry, September 28, 1942. His words confirm once again what we already know and state beyond any doubt that the people from all the transports have been exterminated and no one could possibly have survived. So both those they caught and who's, sorry, and who came of their own will. That's the naked truth. Terrible. On the basis of this account, we've written down a testimony that is so terrible and shocking that it is virtually impossible to describe in human language. Indeed, impossible to describe in human language. Another postcard which says very briefly, 16th of December, Wednesday. I'm jotting down a few words for you as we stop at Praga, which is a train station on the eastern bank of the Vistula River in Warsaw on the way to Treblinka. We're going God knows where, be well. Somebody not knowing where they're going in the midst of all of this. So on the one end, people not knowing where they're going, but on the other end, someone escaping from Treblinka in 42 and telling the Jews in Warsaw what awaited them inside of Treblinka. Could they have done anything? I mean, we could spend months talking about this, but that was 
what they knew. Again, another picture of the destruction of Warsaw, horrible, after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in 43 and in the fall of 44, after the Polish National Uprising. You can see some more pictures. And there are very, very, very few buildings in Warsaw today that are still standing. This is one of them. Condemned, nobody can live in it because it's about to collapse. Miraculously, it survived. Most of those around it didn't. Picture of this young lady, you can see there is the uh, the main church in the old town, but everything else, I mean, just totally, totally destroyed. And in the context of this, this was the area of the, the ghetto. In the context of the ghetto over here were the spots where they found part of that archive in 46 and 1950. So actually outside of the ghetto, they smuggled it out and they buried it with people who were Jews as well as non-Jews who managed to be living outside of the ghetto. A couple of pictures of Jewish market scene before the war and an amazing picture from the internet uh, of this office building, which sits on top of where the Tolmaki Great Synagogue used to be. Remember that big synagogue, 1878? And they put light projection on it to show you the enormity of the synagogue as it was way back when. We're going to be leaving Poland we're going to go to the second major Jewish community there, and that is Krakow. Warsaw right here in the middle. Uh, today, I should say Poland is a country of 33, what is this doing that? Sorry, 33, 35 million people, and uh, similar to the pre-war population. They don't have a major population growth as we do. They have very little immigration. If you've never been to Poland, walk the streets of anywhere outside of Warsaw, and you'll see... 105% of the people walking on the street are Polish. There's very, very little if not, and no ethnic diversity there. Poland is the capital today and was the real center of Jewish world in Poland from the 19th and 20th centuries. Krakow down here, about a four or five hour drive, about a three hour train ride, was the most important city in the 1600s in the Jewish community and historically was the capital of Poland uh, as well. So Warsaw, as I mentioned, 20th century, Krakow, 16th century, center of Jewish community we've already talked about in Poland, a third of the city was Jewish. Uh, the center, and Jews were only allowed to live in both sides of the river in the early 19th century, and it really became the epicenter of the spreading of, of this kind of cultural clash and religious clash of ideas, enlightenment, should we be engaged intellectually with the larger world around us? Thankfully, some were, and that's why they founded the Jewish Historical Institute, not just Jewish memory, as I mentioned last week, but Jewish history, chronicling the events of human behavior, which then inspired the Onik Shabbat, which then gave us those documents, which I just read. Almost everything was destroyed, except the cemetery survived. There is not much there except memorials. In many ways, a visit to Warsaw, Jewishly, is what I refer to as this absence, sorry, this absence of presence. It's clear that a city that was very Jewish has got very, very little Jewishness left, in sharp contrast to what we'll see in Krakow, which was the center not just of life in Poland, but in all of the Ashkenazi world 400 years ago. It was the home of Rabbi Moses Israelis, one of the greatest rabbis in the 16th century, the Rama, you can see, or the Ramu as he's called um, by some, and it was a place where renowned rabbinic and Talmudic scholars lived to be students of the Ramah. He wrote a book called the Mapa, which literally translates into English as the tablecloth, which was in coordination with a book you might have heard of, maybe more of you have probably heard of, called the Shulchan Aruch, literally the set table in the land of Israel, in the city of Tzfat in the 16th century. Another rabbi was writing a book that is called the Shulchan Aruch, and this book, and this rabbi was in coordination with that book and that rabbi, land of Israel, Sephardic world, Poland, the Ashkenazi world, and they were cooperating. So in this land, this is what we do. You know, simple questions like you're supposed to live in the Sukkah during Sukkot. Well, if Sukkot falls in early to mid-October in Lithuania, you might not really be able to live in the Sukkah. What about foods we can eat? All those different questions of religious law were argued about, but also when the rabbi, Israelis, writes what he writes, he's making sure that his tablecloth is able to work together with the Shulchan Aruch, the set table that is being put in, together in uh, by Yosef Karo in the land of Israel. On his gravestone, in, in uh, you'll see the gravestone in a minute, it says, Mi Moshe le Moshe, from Moses to Moses. In other words, Moshe Rabbeinu, the great Moses, who took us out of Egypt, until Moses Israelis, there was none like 
Moses, what's different, sharp contrast to what we saw in Warsaw with the almost total destruction, was the fact that there is there are, I should say, seven synagogues that were preserved. Many of you might have been to Prague. You've seen the town of Prague where there's a lot of Jewish synagogues. Today, it's one of the nicest parts of, of the old town of Prague. So too in Krakow. A city of 65,000 Jews, about 25% of the population, only a few hundred survived, but it is the home of a now 11, maybe this year ago, 11-year-old JCC. And there, in contrast to this absence of presence, used to be a lot of Jews in Warsaw, there's nothing left. In Krakow, you feel something because there is this presence of absence, because there are these shells of synagogues that function in many different functions, two of them actually as synagogues, that are shadows of what they were beforehand. And there's this palpable sense of this presence of an absence. Something used to be here, but ain't here anymore. Um, and if we look, I pulled this map, forget this map. Um, where are we here? Keep in mind, and we'll see this next week, and that's why I want to talk very briefly about this, is that these colors here show you the green. What happens to Poland? Right? Poland was a very large country. I will look at this map. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. This is Lithuania here in pink. This is Poland in yellow was one of the biggest countries in Europe around the year 1600. By the end of the 18th century, what happens? Russia takes over first here and then here and then here. Much of Poland, the Austro-Hungarian Empire takes over much of Poland and Poland ceases to exist as a country until 1919, until after the First World War. And so Krakow, you see down over there, is part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, whereas Warsaw is part of the Russian Empire, at least until 1919. So keep that in mind. Borders change a lot. Krakow. We've got the cemetery. You can see hundreds of year old cemetery in sharp contrast to the not even 200 year old cemetery in Warsaw. You have a number of synagogues. This is one that actually functions as a synagogue. This is the cemetery on the left and on the right, the synagogue of Rabbi Moses Isserlis, still there in the main square, Kezhemej of uh of uh warsaw of uh, sorry of krakow here you can see redoing in recent years the beautiful synagogue which functions and people oftentimes say i understand mike you said there were forty five thousand jews there are a few hundred there who maintains this well when you go to visit this you pay an entrance fee and that goes to the jewish community that then maintains over many many years even under communism the infrastructure of the synagogues there is the outside of the shul, looks very much like a fortress. Um, there's the gate, there's the building, and then the entrance of the shul is just back over there. And on the right-hand side behind the weeping willow is the massive cemetery. So very typical to synagogues built in the 16th century um, in, uh, across Europe. The most visited, I would say, of the seven synagogues. The second most visited synagogue is this one on the left, which is called the uh, Altshul, the Old Shul. Its foundation goes back to the 15th century. It's been added on many, many, many times. But it isn't really a synagogue today. It's a museum. And it's a museum that tells the story of Judaism. It's like Judaism 101 for non-Jews. Because the majority of people who come to this, it's like the Holocaust Museum in Washington. The majority of people who go through there aren't Jewish. The majority of people who come to this area aren't Jews. They're Poles, they're Germans, they're other tourists. There may be a few hundred thousand Jews a year. But larger numbers are non-Jews. And so the community decided to make this into a museum, not a functioning synagogue that tells the story of the religion and the Jewish people. The third most visited, perhaps my favorite though, is this one on the right, redone. It is called the Temple. Built in 1860 as a progressive slash liberal synagogue in that, again, you'll see up on the left and on the right, women's section, but you'll see in the picture in a moment the bima, uh, the, 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 sorry, the, the arc up over there and the bima right in the middle, beautifully decorated, sign of the wealth of the community on the outskirts physically of the community where it was built. But also it's a group of people who were very inspired by the Enlightenment. The language, the synagogue was built when this city was in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The language of the sermons was in German. The, uh, there was a, an, a, 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 not orchestra, a group of singing, I guess you would call it an orchestra back over here. No, a choir, that's the word I'm looking for. A choir back over above the Bima. Very typical in these choral synagogues built across Eastern Europe, late 19th, 
early 20th century. But women were not part of the minion. I mean, don't think that Rabbi Jessica could have been a rabbi in the synagogue, but very liberal for that time in Poland. And keep in mind, not all Jews in Poland at the time were the ultra-Orthodox images that, again, the perpetrator and their visual images of Jewish life will have us believe that Jews were all looking like the people who look in Mea Sharim today. The last time I was there at the synagogue, a group from Chicago, and there you can see, just in, in terms of proportion, beautiful architecture as well, in terms of the, uh, the Aron HaKodesh, and the little place where the choir would have sat kind of on the top. It's a fantastic structure. Similar if you've been to Prague, the new synagogue, the last one that was built in the old Jewish quarter of Prague. About an hour and a quarter, an hour and a half, depending on traffic, just west of the city was a town called Oshwienchen. Hard to pronounce after 50, uh, 30 times or so in Poland, I think I finally, my Polish colleagues actually say, I think you're doing a decent, decent job on pronunciation. It used to be a town that had more Jews than non-Jews, 56% Jewish population until 1939. In fact, the very name of the city might come from the word Ushpizin, which we have in our, uh, in our uh, sukkah to invite guests. In. It's a term that we use, I don't even know where it comes from, I don't know if it's a Yiddish term or wherever it is, an Aramaic term, but it refers to hospitality. Because it was a town located, very important trade routes, very important rail hub, with trains going across from Eastern to Western Europe to Central Europe, and Jews had a significant role in that community. In the town was a First World War Austro-Hungarian army camp. The Germans turned it into a concentration camp. They added a second story to the buildings. And then in June of 1940, they brought their first political prisoners, some Jews, to Auschwitz. About a year later, a mile and a half down the road, they built Auschwitz II, also known as Birkenau, which was a death camp. They destroyed two Polish villages. And on this site, the Nazis decide that they're going to build a place to murder the Jews of Europe. It functioned as a death camp from March 42 until the fall of 44. There was a small little a revolt by some of the Jews working, the Zunder Commando working in part of the, the process of unfortunately cleaning out the gas chamber crematoria after the, the murder. and was finally abandoned in January 18th, 1945, as inmates were taken on a death march. I know you probably haven't, I'm sure you have in your community, there are how many left, but there are probably Holocaust survivors. There's not an insignificant number who went on these horrible death marches. It's amazing that anybody survived a day, a week, a month, a year or two in a concentration slash death camp. It's even more amazing that they survived the death march. And when I've been to Poland many times with survivors, uh, uh, people always ask them, you know, it was a miracle that you survived. And they always correct the question. It wasn't a miracle. It was an infinite number of miracles, one after the other after the other, that I stayed awake another day, another day, another day. January 27th, the Soviets liberate Auschwitz, Birkenau, and that is why International Holocaust Day is December, is January 27th. We have in the Jewish calendar, Yom HaZikaron, Memorial Day, L'Shoah V'Lagvura, for Holocaust and Heroism. The International Day, though, is from the day Auschwitz was liberated, not by the Americans, but by the Soviets. Um, we're not sure exact numbers. Over a million, maybe 1.1, maybe one and a quarter million people were murdered there. 90% were Jews from across Europe. And if you want to help understand this, and I always say when I'm in Poland, there's a tension between our knowledge and our understanding. In everything that we do, think about it, we hope that the more we learn about a particular subject, the greater we will understand that subject. Math, physics, computers, human behavior, whatever. It doesn't work when it comes to show up. The more you understand, about this horrible crime, the more you know, I should say about it, the less you actually understand it. 90% of people, the biggest Jewish graveyard in the world, over a million probably Jews were murdered in a two and a half year period. So you figure out, what's that? 800 plus days, 10,000 people every single day. The question I oftentimes ask people, I always ask people when I'm there is, how did the world, how did Nazi Germany get to Auschwitz-Birkenau? And the two major theories that historians have spent their entire professional career talking and arguing backwards and forwards. The first is the group called the Intentionalists. They believe that Hitler wanted to murder the Jews from the beginning. 
He needed time to implement the plan. He created this totalitarian dictatorship from within a democratic system, changed the laws, reversed the emancipation, persecuted others and Jews, and then created the final solution sometime in the summer fall of 1941. That is one school that says he wanted to murder the Jews, just a matter of time and getting there. The second school is called the Functionalist School. And they say, listen, Hitler blamed the Jews for all of the world's problems, not just Germany's, wanted to get rid of them. This slippery slope took eight and a half years after he came to power. And only then, in June of 41, with the Einsatzgruppen, is mass murder actually beginning. Then he asks Himmler to ask Heydrich to have this conference. Remember, at Wannsee in Berlin in December 41, it is pushed back until January because of Pearl Harbor. And ultimately, in this conference, on the 20th of January, they cross the T's and dot the I's in this final solution to the Jewish problem of Europe. It's hard to believe that most historians who say it's probably, a number of historians who are saying more and more, it's a combination of these two schools of thought, but there are many more German, Israeli, American historians who fall into this category. They believe not that Hitler intended to murder the Jews at the beginning. He wanted to get rid of them not necessarily murder them, but this slippery slope of anti-Jewish policies ultimately led to the creation of concentration camps and then death camps only in 41, 42, gives a sense that, that perhaps this school is correct. And if that is true, that's all the more imperative for us, humanity that is, to understand how intolerance can get to that situation in the eight and a half years that it took Hitler to the final solution. Of course, Auschwitz won the famous pictures of Arbeid Machfar, work will make one free as you walk through it. The Jewish orchestra with some of the most talented musicians in the world on the right hand side playing German you know, military marching tunes day after day after day. Um, again, how it looks maybe uh, a little bit harsher. I've been there when it snows and when it's brutally cold and I'm wearing the best uh, uh, you know, warmth money can buy in terms of Gore-Tex and, and, and protection and it still keeps me not very warm on the coldest and coldest of days. Um, I found these recently. Um, one is uh, from a leader of the reform movement in America, dated 29th of August, 1942. Wait a minute. No, that the date of the thing that I just read, I just realized this from 19 from the Onik Shabbat group was September. Right? That was September of 1942. Crazy. A month, a month beforehand. Um, he writes the following. I received through foreign office the following message from Geneva received alarming report that in numbers headquarters plan discussed and under consideration all Jews in countries occupied and controlled Germany, three and a half, four million should after deportation at one blow exterminated. In other words, already in 42 American Jewish leadership knew what was happening. And this letter from 1945, April of 1945, from Eisenhower to Marshall for your eyes only, it's hard to read. I visited one of these, the concentration camps, they liberated the American forces in 45. And I assure you that whatever has been printed on them to date has been an understatement. I'm doubtful that some British individuals in similar categories visit, etc. In other words, only then did Eisenhower in charge of all the Allied forces in Europe, realize the full extent of the brutality of Nazi crimes. If you've seen the movie, the HBO series was a band of brothers. Remember the last episode? They're fighting from their training D-Day all the way across Europe for years. And then the last episode, they think the war is over and they stumble upon this totally different planet, a bergen belsen or another camp in Germany that the Allies discover. Um, aerial pictures from the Allies. Why was an Auschwitz bombed? Big questions. Again, libraries have been written about it, but it's clear from 1944 there already were intelligence images coming in. The theory of the Allies was quite simply, we will not do anything to jeopardize our ability to win the war as quickly as possible. And of course, when one visits the horrible pictures of the death today, there's this absence of anything there outside of this horrible feeling that a million people were murdered. This on the far distance over there is this, which is the main entrance which takes about 20 minutes at a good pace to walk from one end to the other, to give you a sense about the enormity of this horrible factory of death, Auschwitz, which I think in many ways is the symbol of the Shoah. Two or three more last slides. The most famous testimony of Auschwitz is the Auschwitz album, discovered by a woman named Lily Jacobs, a Hungarian woman in 1945 after the liberation in a camp in, uh, I think she was in France or in Germany, one of the two. Um, horrible pictures taken by a German soldier sometime in the spring, between the spring, summer of 45, 
44, sorry, when over 400,000 Hungarian Jews were murdered. Um, and you see young and old in this picture, which tells us that they're already been selected and they're waiting to be taken into the gas chamber. There is the selection on the right between men and women. And this mother or grandmother may be giving her daughter or granddaughter a little bit of food, hoping that, not knowing what's around the corner. And literally beyond these birch trees were those gas chamber crematorium complexes where all those people in those pictures were murdered. I don't want to end with that. I want to end rather with the JCC in Krakow, which 10 years ago, 11 years ago, opened up. This is the back of the temple synagogue, the beautiful one with the gold and red that I showed you. This is the JCC. About 11, 12 years ago, I guess, when I was there, I got there a day before my group, and I'm walking around Krakow with my colleagues, and um, we hear all these police sirens everywhere. And I get to the my hotel room that night, and I see on the news, Prince Charles and what's her name, Camilla, Lamilla, whatever, his wife, um, have come to dedicate the new Krakow JCC. I'm like, Krakow JCC, what's going on? And what's the connection, Charles? The next day, my group lands from Toronto, we pick them up at the airport, we walk around Krakow, and I see this little sign hidden behind the tree over there. It says Krakow JCC. I'm like, what? This must be the JCC. And I hear a voice in English with an American accent, Jonathan Ornstein, you'll see him in a minute. The director of the JCC says, yeah. I said, I don't know who this building is going to serve. I mean, there are a couple of hundred old and dying Holocaust survivors in Krakow. Who's it built here to serve? And he said, it's a good question, but I've got to deal with that because I'm the new director of this. Unless I met Jonathan Ornstein, who you will see in a movie, in, in this last, hopefully, in this last movie. Jewish communities around the world are made up of many interlocking pieces. JCCs, federations, synagogues, Jewish family services, Hillel's, BBYO, Jewish preschools, kosher restaurants, and many more. In Krakow, our Jewish community also has many components, and all of those pieces are called JCC Krakow. BBYO Hillel Raku Sinapla Jewish education. Kosher catering. Hebrew classes. Visitor services. By supporting JCC Krakow, you're supporting an entire Jewish community and all the pieces that make it up. I wanted, as I say, to end with Jonathan sharing the story of what he has been doing at the JCC Krakow, and for you to understand that there, as I say, is more than just the story of the death or the attempted destruction of Polish Jewry, but rather there is a little bit of life there. I would not say that there is a renaissance of Jewish life there. I would say that they have the first preschool that opened up in uh, in Krakow since the Second World War. There are hundreds of people every single week who come in there of all ages for all sorts of activities. Um, and I think it's a good thing, but I don't think it suggests that there's going to ever be, as there was up until 1939, this amazing flourishing Jewish community that is there. But even if it's a little, I think Jews all over have a sense of responsibility, not just of uh, remembering, but also of preserving what is still actually there. And I'll end with one story before I see my time. I got another minute for questions, Rabbi, and that is <laughs> that um, I, I hear stories almost every time I have a group that meets the chief rabbi there or Jonathan, the director of the JCC, and someone always says, well, Rabbi, how many Jews are there in Poland? He says, look, you know, we don't count Jews, but I'll tell you a story. 
Last week, a young woman came into my office. She said her grandmother died a few months ago. And just before her grandmother was dying, she came in and whispered her in her ear, you know why we don't have that tree around Christmas? You know why we eat those crackers at Easter time? She says, I'm Jewish. And the grandmother hid her Judaism for all those years of communism, kept her daughter or son protected by hiding the fact that she was Jewish and therefore her child was Jewish. But now she was able to tell her grandchild as she was dying that she was Jewish. So the rabbi says, can't tell you how many Jews there are, but there's one more today than there was just a few weeks ago. Amazing. Mike, what's remarkable about your teaching is like the documents you have access to and that you show us and the images. Do you, as a tour guide, do you share with other guides these? Like, how are you getting access to the materials you're getting? Um, well, a lot of them, a lot of them are pictures that I have that are my own pictures that I've taken over there. Obviously, mm -hmm. the ones that there's so much stuff that's out there on the Internet. Um, and whenever I guide, whether it's in Israel or whether I guide uh, abroad, that file cabinet over there is filled with lots of stuff, lots of pictures. And it's bizarre, actually, um, Rabbi, because it's easier for me to show a visual image here than it is when I'm in the field. Because I put it up on a screen and everybody sees it. If I'm standing at Masada, for example, and it's sunny, right. it's hard for people to see the images. So I have, and, and every place I, I, I guide, uh, sorry, I, I do an online session for, I've guided to, and I'm going through all the pictures that I have on you know, my iPad and my iPhone, and I'm trying to integrate them together with pictures that I have done on the internet. But it's definitely a collaborative right. effort over many, many years of sharing knowledge and information and stories, because there, there are so many stories, and it's so much a part of, Jewish memory, this notion of who we are. And if we don't know the stories, we can't pick and choose what stories we want to celebrate and what stories we want to commemorate and what stories we want to lift us up, rather than just focus on the stories that kind of take us down with all those horrible memories of the destruction, the pogroms, etc. Thank you. And next week, I believe, is Ukraine, correct? Uh, One no, of our Ukraine, Russia. Oh, Russia. One of our assistants in the um, rabbinic office. Um, okay. Hopefully, she can be there. She. Uh... I've never. I've never been to the Ukraine. I've been to Russia few, many fewer okay. times than Poland. But um, that's my next step to build sessions in places I've never been to before. But there you go. I'll keep hopefully you posted. You'll get there. Thank you so much. Thanks to Jake, our awesome producer. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you this time next week. Same link. Thank you so that's much. That's for Dania. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Next week. Bye.